Um, so good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carl Meacham, and I am the director of the Americas program here at CSIS. And I'm glad you could join us uh, for this event that I'm thrilled to be co-hosting with the IMF to launch their latest regional economic outlook for the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this event came uh, about following a series of discussions that uh, we had with the team at the IMF. Uh, and it's been a true pleasure to work with them. In particular, I want to thank Alejandro Werner, uh, today's speaker, uh, and the director of the IMF's Western Hemisphere Department, uh, who's going to speak about the report's findings. Uh, and I also want to thank today's discussants, uh, Nicole Golden, who's the director of the Youth Prosperity and Security Initiative here at CSIS, and Barbara Kochwar, who's the research fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. So I'm very happy to have both of you here. Uh, to talk about this. They're exceptional professionals, and I'm happy that they accepted my invitation. <laughs> so uh, what is the Regional Economic Outlook Report? Right? Since 2002, the IMF has produced this series broken down on a regional basis. Uh, the report discusses recent economic developments and prospects all around the world, addressing the key factors that have impacted and will influence economic performance. Uh, the report serves to highlight the pivotal challenges policymakers face in their various contexts. Uh, through using country-specific data and analysis, the report uh, acts uh, as an inclusive window into the inner economic workings of every region in the world. And this year's regional economic outlook for the Western Hemisphere does just that. Uh, I'll leave it to Alejandro to discuss the report's findings in depth, but just to give you all an overview, uh, according to the report, economic growth across Latin America and the Caribbean is expected to remain somewhat subdued, coming in around 2.5% this year. Uh, financial market volatility will continue to present substantial risk for the region, as will sharp declines in commodity prices. Um, those are basically the broad brushes. Now, when we deal with these issues, we're dealing with the bigger sort or, or the, the policy implications of these issues. And that's why we've assembled a, a sort of diverse group of folks to talk about this. Um, I don't want to go into any other details, but I would just make an observation that much of the report's conclusions drive home how deeply connected Latin America is to the global market. Uh, it is the US recession that has been so determinant of economic growth in much of the region in recent years. And it is the stronger recovery of the United States and other developed economies that will bolster export growth in the region. Uh, and as a result, continue to fuel the region's recovery. Similarly, among the biggest risks to the region's economies is an economic slowdown in the world's largest markets, especially the United States and China. Uh, such, a sizable, such sizable consumer markets inevitably play a large role in determining commodity prices. And as you all know, uh, the region depends uh, on commodity exports. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Alejandro to discuss the report in more depth. Following his remarks, uh, Nicole and Barbara will give their reactions to the report, and we will have a, uh, a discussion. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A as well. And I would, all I would remind you that today's event is on the record, uh, that we're webcasting the event in real time to our online audience. So hello, folks who are watching. Uh, and during the Q&A, I would ask that you identify yourselves. Uh, and uh, if you want to say something that you think is really important, please do. But try to keep it brief. Uh, we're more interested in your questions. So without further ado, Alejandro. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the, the invitation. And let me be uh, relatively brief to, to leave space for, for comments and, and questions. As you said, the report touches some of the main issues that we think are going to be influencing the economies in Latin America for the next uh, 12 to 24 months. We looked upon the impact of a uh, normalization of US monetary policy throughout the region. We look about, uh, at the impact of the slowdown and decline in commodity prices on growth, especially in South America. And we look at the, challenge, the challenges that might be arising in the financial sector and in fiscal policy throughout Latin America. But I think this combination of factors basically is painting a picture in which Latin America is entering a slower growth phase than the one we have seen in the last 10, 10 years. Um, uh, that uh, subdued growth was estimated at 2.5% when we put the report out. Um, this is the lowest rate of growth for Latin America in the last 10 years. 
if you take away 2009, when the impact of the world financial crisis severely hit Latin America. But taking away 2009, this is the slowest rate of growth in the last uh, 10 years. We do think an important part of that is explained by the fact that commodities are slowing down, but also a lot of South American economies had already reached their potential GDP. I mean, the economies in Latin America started growing really fast in 2003, 4, 5, with the commodity cycle, but starting from a position of a significantly negative output gap and a lot of unused resources. So they actually were in a very good position to take advantage of the huge pool by China and India, et cetera, through commodity prices to have a, an extremely good run of growth all the way up, let's say, until 2010, 2011. And then we have seen economy after economy start to slowing down. I mean, Brazil did it first, starting in 2011. Uh, we have seen Chile slowing down significantly at the end of last year and beginning of uh, this year. Mexico has been in a low growth stage for a long period of, uh, of time. And now we are also seeing, I mean, those economies that closed down significantly in the last 10 years, but were being benefited by a huge income windfall from commodities like Venezuela and Argentina, et cetera, started to feel uh, the external financing constraint significantly and therefore uh, slowing down, maybe to show negative growth in both cases this year. In our forecasts, we have, I mean, Venezuela growing at a negative rate in 2014, and Argentina growing still at a very slightly low positive rate. When our new forecast comes out, we will have to update it, and the first quarter in both economies have not been uh, terribly good, and therefore there might be some downward bias to the, to the region as a whole, uh, because the first quarter, I mean, the first quarter was pretty bad for the US, and it was bad uh, for the world economy as a whole. So let me, instead of touching on the more conceptual issues that some of our chapters touch upon in, in, in the report, let me try to give you a, a broad view on how do we think things countries by countries. And let me start with the two largest economies in Latin America, Brazil and Mexico. In Brazil, our, our let's say, broad, broad diagnosis is basically that the Brazilian economy in 2010 reached potential and actually went beyond potential. Uh, the counter-cyclical efforts to stimulate the economy generated important overheating symptoms. So inflation started to go up, the current account deficit started to widen, and now the Brazilian economy is trapped in a situation of low growth, some inflationary pressures, and a widening current account deficit. And, I mean, it is in a situation in which after the huge increase in growth associated with uh, the commodity boom, the reforms of the first Lula administration, and the deepening of its financial system, it has reached a new level of GDP, but growing from this new level has become much harder, especially in an economy that invests too little. If you look at the investment ratio in Brazil, it's around 18% of GDP, one of the lowest in Latin America. Productivity growth is relatively low. And when you look at the unemployment rate, it's at the historical minimum. So to grow at a faster rate, Brazil would have to increase its investment, its investment, increase its productivity growth, uh, shift its economy more towards the external sector and a little bit less towards the domestic market. Mm. Uh, so that requires an important change in the policy mix, and it also will require an, an important focus on structural issues. Uh, the government has been focused on infrastructure, that it's an important structural bottleneck, but we do think that the structural agenda would need to be much broader to, to, to move to significantly reduce red tape, simplify the tax system, etc. So for Brazil to grow more, it, it goes beyond just a macro policy adjustment. I think uh, it will imply significant structural reforms in Brazil. So going forward, basically our, our forecasts are for other two years of low growth, a macroeconomic adjustment, and hopefully under the scenario of important reforms, a pickup in growth, a significant pickup in growth, 
start in, 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 in a couple of years. If we go to Mexico, Mexico is a very different story than what I just told. I mean, Mexico has been the country that has grown the least from the big economies in Latin America in the last 10 to 12 years, basically because Mexico suffered, I mean, the inverse shock that South America suffered. I mean, South America benefited from the full entrance of China into the global economy, while Mexico had a negative effect because Mexico competed with Chinese goods in the US market. So that generated very low growth in Mexico for a long period of time. And now things were starting to reverse in Mexico. I mean, the relative unit labor cost between Mexico and China, the big advantage that China had 12 years ago had been completely closed. A, a lot of firms are coming back to other uh, sources of, of, of production. The, the disadvantage that electricity cost and natural gas cost implied in Mexico in the early 2000s has turned on its head with the huge developments in the natural gas sphere in the US. So now Mexico is being a beneficiary of the natural, of the shale gas boom in the US by importing cheap natural gas. Mm -hmm. And I think throughout this period, Mexico has worked to significantly improve its uh, logistical platform as being part of the supply chain to the US. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, the unit labor cost, cheap energy, a, an important logistical advantage, and a relatively competitive exchange rate has put Mexico in a place to uh, have a significant recovery in its economy. If on top of this, you factor in eventually uh, the effects of the structural reforms on the energy and telecom side, I mean, Mexico could be doing well in the next few years. Having said that, in the last six quarters, Mexico has been growing at a very, very low rate. Part of that uh, was due to the change in government and a significant deceleration in government expenditure problems in their construction and infrastructure sector, et cetera. And part of that might be uh, explained, especially in the last few quarters, by the uncertainty associated with a broad package of structural reforms. I mean, you still need a lot of secondary legislation to go through. Uh, also, a lot of these reforms that are good from a medium-term perspective by, by imposing more competition on the economy have an effect on the short run because by challenging monopolies, those monopolies slow down the rate of investment mm -hmm. and the new entrants are not here yet. So this process takes time and it, mean, it might generate, as we have seen, some deep in growth to eventually start growing at a higher rate. But in that sense, I mean, uh, we are assuming a 3% rate of growth for 2014. Maybe that will have some downward bias looking forward to our next revision, but we expect Mexico to, to, to accelerate its rate of growth in the next few years. Then when you look at the Pacific Rim, I mean, we do see Chile, Colombia, and Peru have done extremely well. It's a commodity story and a macro stability and predictability of policies story. Those economies will be slowing down with the commodity cycle. We do think that, I mean, we have already seen symptoms that Colombia is following, uh, sorry, Peru is following Chile in its recent slowdown. And Colombia is uh, recovering from some slowdown in 2013 and also benefiting from still high energy prices uh, for, their, uh, for their exports. But eventually we do see uh, like a generalized slowdown there. And then, I mean, when we touch upon these economies like Venezuela and, and Argentina, economies that have uh, closed themselves significantly vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, for a long period of time they were benefiting by very high windfalls coming from commodity prices. When you look at Venezuela, I mean, we did a study a while ago, and we basically calculated the windfall gain in 10 years from the increase in the price of oil, and that accounted to almost 300% of GDP. So Venezuela in 10 years got three times its annual GDP as an additional export income. So obviously that explains why you can do relatively well, even in an environment in which you have huge microeconomic distractions and huge institutional weaknesses. Now, as the price of oil has stabilized and production has, has continued to, to fall, I mean, obviously the external constraint is starting to bite. 
we're seeing significantly high inflation, the highest inflation in, in the world. And obviously in 2014, a negative rate of growth, huge scarcity, etc. The case of Argentina, the Argentinian government did, I think, an, took important steps at the beginning of the year to adjust to the external constraint by depreciating the currency, by uh, tightening monetary policy, by uh, reducing some subsidies, and by starting a re-engagement process with the international community, I think with the aim of eventually retapping international capital markets sometime down the, down the road, trying to skate the external financing constraint and trying to generate some macro stabilization and an environment to start developing the, their new energy sources. And that painted a picture that had an important adjustment in the short run with the sweetener that in the long run there's important uh, investment opportunities in the energy sector in Argentina to be developed. And with this uh, rejoining of the international community, there will be some incentives for foreign capital to go into that, uh, into that sector together with uh, local capital. Obviously, yesterday's uh, Supreme Court decision with, in the US would, would have to be analyzed with more detail to understand the options for Argentina going forward. But I think that was uh, the, the scenario that we had uh, before. Tough adjustment in the next 12 months, and hopefully with a continuation of policy changes, a recovery uh, going, uh, go, going forward. Central America, we have concerns. I mean, slow growth, uh, fiscal weaknesses, a, a very heavy electoral process in the last 12 months. So we have a lot of new administrations that are facing significant uh, fiscal challenges in an environment in which maybe placing bonds in international markets will be tougher and tougher. Uh, and therefore, that, uh, uh, that help that they had to maintain a, a, a weaker fiscal stance might no longer be there. So uh, we will see these uh, new governments implementing important adjustments to uh, put, put their fight their public finances in a sustainability path, but we will be seeing, I mean, a slight help from the US remittances, tourism and exports, but also significant counter currents coming from the domestic economy, especially in those cases in which important fiscal weaknesses are present. And obviously the, the, the Caribbean in the same situation uh, of very high debt, uh, financial <coughs> sector weaknesses, uh, and very low growth. So, I mean, there we have been working with some, uh, some countries uh, with IMF programs, with uh, TA in, in other cases, but obviously uh, it's a situation that has a significant, a multiplicity, a multiplicity of vulnerabilities that will show up in the next 24 months on a country by country basis, especially in those cases in which we have financial sector fragilities or in those cases in which we have very high debt uh, in an environment in which tapping the markets will be uh, harder and harder. So that's a little bit a, a broad view at the, at the region under the umbrella that we think uh, for the next few years we will be facing a tougher economic environment overall. And, and I think this tougher economic environment will be a real time stress test for good policies. Overall, we have many countries in the region that had implemented relatively good <coughs> policies, but it's easier to implement good policies in a good environment, and now we're going to see the true face of many of these governments under more stressful times. So it will be a time for more volatility, not only being imported from uh, the US, China, and the rest of the world, but also some local, locally generated uncertainty. Before I get to Nicole, just on that issue, I mean, is there a fear that protectionism could start creeping in uh, uh, in reaction to this slow growth in certain countries? I mean, is it, or, or do you see I, it as them sort of being on the straight and narrow? No, I, I, I don't have that fear no. because uh, in terms of protectionism, I, I, I think a significant part of Latin America actually took advantage of the good years mm -hmm. to protect. So now that they, they, they face tougher times, I think maybe the reaction would be to stay where they are or to open up a bit. Uh, 
So, for, uh, so, so we saw that in Argentina, I mean, with very small steps these years to open up or to reduce some of the restrictions that they had on foreign currency transactions. So, I mean, when you look at some economies that have closed up so much, maybe uh, we, have, we will see some of them uh, moving a little bit closer to the center in their policy package. I think the same uh, might be true uh, for the case of Brazil. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to see protectionist pressures appearing in economies like Chile, Venezuela, uh, sorry, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico. So in that sense, uh, we don't see that. I think we might see the temptation to, to retort to, to counter-cyclical mm -hmm. macro policies that were useful during the crisis because the shock was clearly exogenous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now that the shock will no longer be solely exogenous, mm -hmm. if you try to implement counter-cyclical policies, investors might think that you're trying to counteract a permanent change in your trend with transitory policies. And that would lead to loss of confidence, mm -hmm. uh, maybe inflationary pressures, mm -hmm. volatility in FX markets, and, and I think that's, I'm a little bit more worried on a weakening of the macro framework mm -hmm. than uh, structural changes on a trade policy. Okay. Okay. Nicole, any reactions? Sure, great. Well, thank you. Thanks again yeah. for, for having me. It's, um, as the leader of the, the youth initiative, I like having the chance to put on my broader development um, mm -hmm. hat as well. And I think the report has some really interesting um, implications from a, from a development perspective, um, a little more political economy, if you will. And it's interesting because while obviously the, the divergent dynamics that the report speak to, I think there were three probably somewhat develop, uh, trends across the region um, and implications from a development side um, that, that I saw and, and going forward if the, one of the, the overall recommendation boosts productivity and competitiveness. So taking that onto the development side, three things I think about inequality and where inequality you know, um, will affect and be affected by um, economic growth, um, the enabling environment and governance, which you spoke to a little bit, um, and then inclusion. And um, by that, sort of youth, putting my youth hat back on, um, and also um, women. So just a, a couple thoughts on each of those. On, on the inequality piece, um, you know, the Latin America region, as we know, has some of the highest rates of income inequality in the world, although it's an issue that is, is front and center right now in, um, in the U.S., in the global agenda, um, the global economic agenda, when we think about the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals, inequality certainly rises um, in, in that discussion as well. Um, just you know, by way of example, I know Colombia's sort of Gini coefficient um, at 56, um, Brazil's at 55, uh, Chile 52, Peru at 48. So all in that sort of middle range. Um, and while you rightly speak of the you know infrastructure varies, um, and we know health, education, um, and and work um, access to health, education, and work outcomes will vary. Again, that inequality, and with it, um, some of the social implications um, of that inequality um, are things to consider, especially when we think about competitiveness and, and what that means in terms of the go forward and how inclusive the growth is. Um, one thing we've seen is that, unfortunately, um, in particularly in middle income and emerging economies, it's that it's middle class and underserved populations that are often most affected by economic slowdowns, um, and we'll speak to that a little bit more. Um, in fact, just yesterday, actually, um, Oxford, University of Oxford, released its latest multidimensional poverty index. And as they found in the past, this year, in this year's version, 70% of the world's poor are actually living in middle income wow. economies. Um, and so something we need to think about is, Yes, we want to promote economic growth, but what are the, the social and other political and economic implications when you have growth without equality or growth and inequality? Um, we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, on, on the competitiveness side, I mean, we spoke about the, I'll leave it to my colleagues to speak more on the structural issues and some of the infrastructure pieces that you mentioned. Um, but I think one of the other things you need to think about, again, in a development context is um, the role of governance and transparency. Um, that's um, 
for something that, again, in, in the global context comes up widely and where there are still some, some gaps in terms of um, if you look, for example, at um, the a corruption perception index or transparencies um, ranks Brazil at, at 72 of 177 uh, and you know, El Salvador at 83rd. Um, if you think about the enabling environment, which you spoke to, but from a, from a private sector business enabling environment perspective, if you think about the doing business indicators, for example, and where countries stand there, uh, again, you know, Brazil at 116 of 189, El Salvador at 118 of 189. So clearly some room for growth in sort of boosting that product, that, that private sector investment. Um, and with that, back to the, the third piece, which relates to, I would say, both um, enabling environment as well as um, competitiveness and boosting productivity is is inclusion. Um, and again, I'll defer to my colleagues to talk about some of the structural side of, of the, the fiscal and monetary constraints. Um, but with the boosting of productivity, I mean, this is where, again, on a, on a regional trend and really on a global trend, um, whether it's the impact of the recession in the US or the global recession, um, the region is un unfortunately subject to some of the same uh, fates in terms of youth, global youth unemployment and the challenges associated with that. Um, the population-wide, obviously, in the Latin America region is sort of in the middle of its demographic transition, if you will. So um, maybe not as hard hit by, you know, by um, as say Middle East or North Africa. But still, I mean, regional rates vary, but measured youth unemployment is still sitting at in the high teens uh, to, to low twenties across the region, um, and the drag of that sort of unproductive labor force, if you will, that untapped labor force, um, not only on the individuals, but again, on the governments, whether it's a higher um, burden of assistance, um, foregone tax revenues, and, and therefore sort of affecting the domestic resource mobilization. Um, it's something I think to, to think about um, going forward and what the impacts, and similarly, um, the women, um, women's labor force participation rates tend to be lower in the region um, compared to elsewhere. Um, just an example, um, though there was an increase of the labor force participation from 50% in 2000 to 52% um, in 2010, still well below the male labor force participation rate of 80%. So again, you know, that the opportunity to just engage um, more in the workplace. And what's behind the youth unemployment um, and unemployment in general, um, lots of issues, again, that we can sort of talk through in detail later, but part of that relates back to the investment in education outcomes that the report, you know, recommends, again, across the region, um, not only to increase opportunity and maybe level of plan, the, address some of the issues on the inequality side, um, but also to um, bring forward the human capital um, and therefore hopefully score up some of the, the labor force side, and we can get into each of those in a, in a little bit more. Great. Well, thank you very much Barbara. and um, yeah. you know, very interesting comments. Thanks, Carl, for inviting me. Sure. This is great. I mean, the, the Western Hemisphere regional outlook is something that probably most people in the audience look forward to eagerly um, and, and read with great interest. And this one certainly didn't disappoint, um, although it probably caused most of us to feel a little bit more sobering since the message is, is quite serious. Um, I want to congratulate Alejandro and the team. I think that there's some very useful pieces in the report, particularly for those of us trying to puzzle through um, the prospect for the hemisphere, the decomposition of the impact on, of commodity price slowdown on the region and of US tapering is very interesting. Probably you'll get the most hits, though, particularly after yesterday on, on box 2.2 .2, on the potential <laughs> spillovers from Argentina and Venezuela and the rest of the hemisphere. So if you haven't looked at that, um, that's, you know, before you go and manage your portfolio, you might want to take a look at that, too. Um, the main messages of the report seem to be, obviously, that we've had a decade of prosperity and of good results, for the most part, with some um, exceptions, but in the hemisphere, and that that has now come to an end. We've seen the storm coming for a while, we've seen the clouds gathering, um, and these message of subdued growth, I think, is a wake-up call that was, was made um, a, a while ago, and is certainly a message to policymakers that the good times 
are, are over um, in, in the way that, that they have been. And so you cannot rely anymore on external demand for your economic development model. And this will reveal even greater the second message, which is, I think, how bifurcated the hemisphere is. And Alejandro mentions the countries that have closed themselves versus countries that have more openly engaged in the international system. Um, I have six minutes, so I'll refer to them as the 21st century socialists versus the 21st century capitalists, recognizing that there's variability and there are substances, subtle, subtleties to that, but six minutes. So, yeah. um, I think this bifurcation stands to get much worse in the face of tougher economic conditions and countries that do not have a plan B to deal with this um, will have a, a, a day of reckoning. So the past decade has been good, but as the report points out, the near future brings several risks. The region has experienced sustained macroeconomic growth, much of it buoyed by external economic conditions much of it also buoyed by good policies, and so that's the, the light rays in this report. Inflation has been low with the exception of a couple of countries who are in the ranks of the highest inflation countries in, in the world. Um, external debt has been at record lows except for the Caribbean and Central America. Reserves have been built up and policymakers have been able to focus on some of the social inclusion issues and some of the inequality issues that Nicole has talked about. And here is where I think a lot of attention needs to be paid. Macroeconomic stability plus concerted pro-poor policies against a background of good external economic conditions have helped policymakers lift millions and millions of people out of poverty. The middle class in Latin America has increased by 50%, and so now you have a large tranche of people that has the potential for greater economic participation, for greater welfare, and the potential to make their children better off. Um, the middle class now, by most measures, encompasses about a third of the population. You can argue with that, and we could do that in the comments. Um, but the message is that things have been much better for a great tranche of the population. What will happen now that the favorable external economic conditions are waning? The current challenge is to maintain these gains and to build on these gains in a situation where there are fewer degrees of policy freedom. Unfortunately, the work is still incomplete. Although the policies that were implemented have brought people into a better setting economically um, and in terms of access to education and some services, um, pro-poor programs have gotten kids into school but have not necessarily increased the quality of education. People have, been, have gained in terms of quantity of education but are not necessarily in a position where their skills match the needs of the workforce. And so this hasn't yet provided a competitiveness boost um, or a sustainable welfare boost. And so that needs to be addressed. There's also major pressure on politicians, as we've seen most markedly in Brazil and in countries like Chile, to respond to the rising frustrations of people who've seen their lot improve but are worried that their lot will not continue to improve or that their lot will decrease. They've also, with additional education and additional political awareness, become more aware of some of the problems that are inherent in their country that might prevent them from taking more advantage of those opportunities. It can be expensive for politicians to respond to these demands, however. And as the report points out, during this period of prosperity, expenditure as a share of GDP has risen against the background of high commodity prices. And so fiscal um, government budgets are seeing more and more pressure as we enter into a period of lower economic growth. So, there are a number of challenges in order to sustain this model that governments have built up and maintain the welfare of people who have come into the middle class, they need to address a number of issues. These inclu include continuing to bolster social capital. Nicole referred to youth unemployment. The knee needs is a big issue in Latin America. Young people who are neither employed nor in education. Um, infrastructure, much has been done, <clears throat> but there continues to be an infrastructure gap, particularly with the threshold countries in East Asia. Estimates um, place the negative consequences of infrastructure as eating about a quarter of 
GDP growth per year, and this is a quarter of growth that most countries would very much like to have back. Um, so insufficient infrastructure both has domestic GDP and access implications and also keeps some of the countries out of global value chains. Um, household debt has been increasing, so as part of the boom, consumers have had more access to financing. In situations where you've seen consumer debt increase by a factor of four, one becomes worried that this might become an issue for individuals in terms of paying this back. Um, competitiveness and government efficiency, and Nicole did a wonderful job of covering that and continuing inequality. Um, if you look at the trade policy scenario, I think this is where you have the starkest divide among countries. You have the Pacific Alliance countries that are opening more and more that have free trade agreements with just about everyone and who are in some way participating in the mega regionals and in the plurilaterals that are rewriting the rules of the international trading system. And the rest of Latin America is left out. Um, I wonder what the implications are for the region and for the world of this bifurcation. We've also noted a shift in dependence from the EU and the US to China and East Asia. Um, and I'm not sure that all countries have a plan B in effect for the slowdown and growth of those economies. Um, so that's also something that's worrisome and is addressed in the report. Now, two unknowns that were not in this report, but that I think would be very interesting in future reports. What are the implications of some of the geostrategic moves that we've seen, which I'm sure will have an impact on prices um, and on some of the relationships in the hemisphere? And climate change. Climate change, the area that has the you know, probably the most immediately immediate effect of climate change is the Caribbean, um, which is facing dire economic straits, but also dire climate prospects. Um, but obviously, will have impacts on the economic projections and the welfare projections of citizens in um, well, all regions. So I think the real challenge in the hemisphere in the short to medium term is how to not allow this past decade of prosperity to be known in the history books as the decade of lost opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for your, for your opening, uh, for your reactions and for your opening. Let, let me just start off with Alejandro a little bit. Um, do you think Latin America is better equipped to deal with the, uh, with the challenges that it's facing right now? Yeah, let me. Uh, I mean, I think I, I close on a very sour note, and I do think <laughs> that that question gives me the, the opportunity to, to correct myself. Yeah. I mean, in terms of growth, I think the challenges are there. In terms of the initial conditions to face this environment, especially financially, Latin America is much better equipped than in the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it was mentioned af after me that, I mean, we have the highest level of international reserves that we have seen uh, historically. We have in many countries very low inflation and flexible exchange rates mm -hmm. that have, a, I mean, helped these countries a lot in adjust. I mean, today you work at the central bank in Latin America, in Chile. I mean, something happens in Europe. And when the governor of the central bank wakes up, already the currency has depreciated by 5%. He mm -hmm. cannot do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, he would have spent one third of his reserves for five months trying to fight this situation, when he realized that it's impossible, he's much, he, I mean, his balance sheet would be much weaker, and he have been doubling the bet, and therefore the effects of the devaluation would have uh, been much higher. I mean, just remember the case of the Teso Bonos in Mexico. I mean, when Mexico basically converted its local currency debt into foreign currency debt, maybe in, the, in 12 to 18 months. So after 18 months, they have completely dollarized the economy. They were not able to avoid the devaluation. When the devaluation takes place, then the effect on fiscal, the, on the fiscal situation was twice as bad. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the financial sector, I mean, banks in Latin America are quite robust. Capitalization ratios are quite good. Uh, they have their own source of uh, uh, funding. They don't have a lot of uh, wholesale funding, et cetera. I think they're pretty robust, both from a liquidity and the capitalization ratio, although there are some problems with household uh, balance sheets overall. I mean, you see a private sector that it's not as leveraged as it has been in the past. 
So I think they're well prepared to handle this situation. Mm -hmm. I think in those cases, or where do potential problems can arise? It's the combination between a low growth environment and a bad policy reaction. Mm -hmm. So they're starting from a good position, but if you actually try to fight the slowdown for a protracted period of time, you might, you might end up building up the vulnerabilities mm -hmm. that eventually will generate problems. But that's not the situation okay. now. Okay. That's my, uh, let me just stop up, up sure. on, I think there's a key issue with inclusion, inequality, et cetera. And I think a country that, uh, as it has been the case in the last two decades, is taking the lead in doing this or in starting this discussion is Chile. Now today in Chile we're seeing that although Chile has done extremely well in managing its, its macroeconomy in the last two decades, I mean again when you look at education outcomes, mm -hmm. I mean they're pretty poor. Yeah. And now I think they're engaging in a broad uh, reform effort to basically with the Chilean fiscal uh, rectitude, mm. basically raising taxes to fund a very important uh, effort on on, ed on education. So, so, so I think uh, this discussion of how to escape the middle income trap, how to move forward in terms of growth, but uh, maintaining and improving uh, the gains that have been achieved in social indicators, I think the Chilean discussion now it will be an example that the region will be looking very closely at. And, and of course, with the Chilean situation, since they're going to increase tax and the growth is lower, it's sort of controversial mm -hmm. to be funding the education sector. There's, well, you know, there's no. a conversation mm -hmm. going on with that, but let me ask you a question about that. So there's inequality, uh, and there are groups that are affected disproportionately. I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit, are there ways to mitigate the effects that we're seeing in the sloth of growth on these groups? So a couple things, just to pick up on the, on the education point, because I think that is probably one of the most foundational investments that can be made to level the playing field, if you will, um, and mitigate some of the disproportional effects of the economic slowdown, again, over time. Um, and, and your point about you know, Chile, it's interesting, if you look at the most recent PISA scores, um, which um, came out, uh, they were done for 2012, just released, and PISA currently measures um, about 65 countries, OECD plus. And across all of the, it's in maths, science, and, and reading literacy, again, among 15-year-olds. And Chile, of the Latin America, Caribbean countries, is the only one that scores above, um, that sort of doesn't land and say the bottom dozen, um, of those measured in all of the three. Um, and so to your point about you know, that the investments have paid off, we're seeing that, and, and to Barbara's point as well, um, but clearly even though a number of the countries are making the investment, um, there has not been enough attention to the quality, and whether that's the teacher training, the curriculum, lots of things we can talk about as far as why the outcomes may not be equivalent to the investment in education. Um, but Peru, it comes in, it falls in last place of those of those scored across all three of, of the buckets. So, investing in education, um, ch focusing on quality of education, um, what kids are learning um, across the life cycle of education. Again, looking to secondary and higher education beyond primary. Now that um, the region has you know good um, uh, good performance at the primary level. Um, and as well as engaging the private sector, I think that's where um, one of the other tools, not only on the education front, but in health services, in reaching um, poor, vulnerable, you know, the more marginalized communities, um, focusing on where you can engage and leverage private sector resources um, to support public resources is, I think, an area of, of opportunity. And similarly, technology. Um, education is probably one of the, 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 the lasting divides, if you will, um, that's um, bringing the, um, inequality. But technology is increasingly, um, obviously, a tool and a platform for opportunity and access. But at the same time, those without access to technology are that digital divide is, is bringing with it, in some cases, further inequality. So um, enhancing access to, you know, whether it's mobile technology, you know, internet, um, recent studies of sort of digital natives show the region sort of average, if you will. Um, and the last point I'll make on terms of how um, to sort of mitigate some of the um, impact and inequality, 
is better understanding where the inequality lies. Mm. Um, and this is something that's coming up again in, in, the, in the broader global context is better data and measurement and understanding again who, where the gaps are and where the inequality lies um, both within regions, um, so whether it's rural or urban, um, and across social groups and, and different population groups. So I think closer attention to, again, better data collection and monitoring of how people are doing and assets and different aspects of, of the inequality and in income um, will then, again, better enable a response that is, 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 is mitigating it. So, so Barbara, the economic slowdown is sort of prompted economies to sort of look at themselves and see where they're getting their incomes, et cetera. And a lot of the income that countries are getting is from commodities, right? Uh, so my question, I guess, would be, are there ways of sort of diversifying their economies? Are there any barriers to finding ways to do that, though? Well, I think, you know, obviously there are ways other than prim selling primary yeah. commodities to growing the economy. You've had this huge increase in price and this huge demand for primary economy, so it would have been irrational for countries not to exploit that. Some countries have undertaken policies to safeguard the revenues. The Chilean fund is obviously the most um, prominent example. Other countries have tried to Chile, again, has tried to go into higher value added um, processing of some of the primary commodities, particularly in the, in the agriculture, um, and tried to develop industries there. The Pacific Alliance, which I know you're a great proponent of the Pacific <laughs> Alliance, um, is aiming to bolster regional value chains with a view to exporting more to Asia. And the idea here, I think, is to exploit some of these natural resources to help countries get into higher processing, higher value added activities um, while exploiting their comparative advantage. The other area is services. And here is where you know, we don't talk that much about services, partly because of insufficient data, which makes it more frustrating to write about this. Um, but as data is coming out and people are doing more work on this, um, it, it's becoming a more prominent issue. There's a large initiative at the multilateral le or at the plurilateral level now, the Trade in International Services Agreement, where a number of hemispheric countries are participating, but not all. And services is a growing component of all economies in the hemisphere. And so um, it would be incumbent upon countries to look at the services sector also to see where they can exploit some of their comparative advantages there. Actually, related to that, I have a question for Alejandro, if I may, and that you had talked about um, Mexico and not reaping the benefits of the commodity boom and actually losing some growth. You said that during this period, Mexican growth was slow. How much of the slow growth is attributable to China? And do you think that Mexico might actually benefit from not having been part of that bonanza and having to sort of hunker down and maybe increase its competitiveness in order to compete with China? Or is the new competitiveness just the result of Chinese labor costs coming down? Or is that okay. an unfair okay. question? No, 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 it's, uh, yeah, it's super fair. I, th I, I think... Uh, we didn't I, script this part. <laughs> I think it's very hard to, to, to claim that not having been part of the commodity boom was going, is going to be good for Mexico overall. Because I think, to some extent, in many countries in the region, this uh, commodity windfall has not been that poorly managed mm -hmm. to claim that it has been a curse. Right. I mean, I think that it could have been managed better, mm -hmm. but it wasn't mismanaged. So in that sense, I think Mexico, uh, well, in a sense, from the non-diversification view, it has been blessed by being next to the largest market in the world, mm -hmm. and it has been exploiting that comparative advantage through NAFTA, being a, a, a manufacturing exploit exporting platform to the US. Mm -hmm. The other countries in South America have been commodity powerhouses, some of them in copper, mm -hmm. agricultural good, et cetera, and each of them has exploded the way they, they can. I, I am convinced that the Chinese shock, I mean, if you look at some studies, have, t has, have shaved off 
a significant amount of growth from 2002 to 2012, let's say, in Mexico. But I do think that now, uh, as you were saying, a significant part of this has been two or three things. One is, is the labor cost disadvantage of Mexico has, been, has disappeared. Secondly, I think many firms found it much harder to do business in China than what they thought. And they are rethinking, let's say, other uh, places to, to locate their, their manufacturing platforms. I also think that the combination now of cheap natural gas and high oil prices makes Mexico a great place to produce for the U.S. market because mm -hmm. transport costs remain relatively high and energy costs in, in, in North America are low. <laughs> so, so that it's mm -hmm. a, the best combination of energy pricing mm -hmm. that it's possible for Mexico. And there are the challenges to be able to bring natural gas from the U.S. to, uh, to Mexico. So, uh, so I think the advantages or, or Mexico are there. And I do think that sometimes, I mean, Sometimes we are too fast to single out Mexico like the country that now is reacting to this <laughs> bad environment uh, pretty quickly. But basically it's because for the last 10 years, Mexico has suffered that now the Mexican society has come together mm -hmm. and actually pushed for a lot of these reforms that have been discussed for the last decade. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it doesn't take that much in other countries and we see a reform agenda to react to this environment being put in place much faster in the rest of Latin America. Let me um, open it up to questions from, from the audience here. Um, Can I just make a quick follow-up sure, while sure. they get this out tomorrow? Sure, just, sure, sure. Um, because Alejandro, you mentioned agriculture, and I just wanted to kind of add in when thinking about um, some of the investments or reforms that can be made um, to address populations. I mean, one on the agriculture side, I think one of the things we also are taking a closer look at is land tenure. Um, it's something that's coming up increasingly um, around a sort of rural youth and engaging young people in, in agripreneurship, if you will, um, and thinking about you know, value-added agriculture, but particularly in some of the economies where agriculture is still an agribusiness is a rising um, piece of that. I think the, where land tenure and access to land um, for more traditionally marginalized groups is something else to, to kind of think about. In that Excellent. Context. So we're going to take some questions from the audience. We're going to have the questions posed, and then we're going to let you guys answer them. So why don't we start here in the middle? Uh, Clay Lowry, uh, Rock Creek Global Advisors. Um, so Alejandra, um, I, I think this question is for you, but it might be for Barbara, because actually she calls me to ask it. Um, um, <laughs> External vulnerabilities um, or external shocks uh, for Latin America, how do you see them? Uh, I know the report probably presents, I, I just didn't, you didn't talk about it too much, the taper tantrum and U.S. monetary policy and how is that affecting Latin America? I mean, how are you guys looking at that? Secondly was from Barbara's question, which was geopolitical shocks. And for all I know, what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, or potentially even now what's happening in Iraq has absolutely nothing to do with uh, Latin America. But I would think that one, it could change flows somewhat, and secondly, it could certainly change energy markets. And I have a, another question related to that, but you know what, I'll let other people ask. So let me go with Hector over here. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, it, it was touched upon, but I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little more on, on the issue of the middle class, of the new middle classes. Uh, to what extent, if any, this uh, slowdown, w which is significant, I think, uh, will affect uh, particularly the new middle classes, uh, which are the most vulnerable in terms of, you know, well, going back to where they were, uh, they are the ones with the highest expectation, and they're the, the most vocal ones, all right? I mean, those in Rio outside Maracana or you know, middle class Brazilians complaining. And, and I'm, I worry about it, this scenario in terms of political instability in the region. Uh, going through you know, the electoral cycle, Brazil, but not only, and, and so on and so forth. So if, if there is anything in the, on the data about that, thank you. So let's start off with those two. <clears throat> okay, so, so on US monetary policy, and, and in the report we have a chapter, we analyze the effect, let's say, of expected normalization of monetary policy in the U.S. So to the extent that uh, the tightening of monetary policy comes together with uh, 
the expected closing of the output gap in the next three years. Then we evaluate how, let's say, the real sector channel uh, and the financial channel interact in, in these countries. And obviously, I mean, the result is pretty obvious. I mean, those economies like Mexico and Central America will benefit because the real sector channel will be stronger than the financial linkages and the increase in the cost of financing. And South America will have a negative effect. Small, but a negative effect. On top of that comes the most important question is, if normalization takes place in an environment of high volatility, uh, then the financial channel will be stronger. Uh, and how costly could that be? Uh, we saw, let's say, a short sample of that uh, in the taper tantrum. We claim that that was a, a huge shock to monetary policy in the US, because when, when you measure it, through the increase in the 10-year bond or 10-year treasuries, it, it has been the largest shock to monetary policy, let's say, in three years. It actually sent the signal that the end of the loosening cycle uh, was coming closer. It was the, the first pitch that actually uh, did that. And it caught a lot of markets on a very one-sided position because it came after a lot of quantitative easing for, from many central banks. We had just been through the, the Japan quantitative easing, so there was a lot of positioning to actually continue benefiting from appreciating currencies in Latin America, declining interest rate, et cetera, and then they, they, that signal came. I think we think we are now in a much uh, better environment, but if a, a sim similar shocks appear in the next two to three years, they can be disrupted, disrupting. They will take away part of the benefit that we are seeing from the real sector channel. And however, we do think that when you look at how capital inflows were used in Latin America this time around, we compare it with how capital inflows were used in the period going from 1991 to 94. In that uh, episode, first, only one third of capital inflows were FDI. Now, around 50% is FDI. And then when we see, so that tells you that the, the strength of a reversal should be lower. And then when you look at how that, those resources were used, last time around, maybe 2 thirds of the capital inflows were used to financing a widening current account deficit. This time around, only 1 third was used to finance a widening capital, a current account deficit. And the other two thirds were used either by central banks to buy foreign assets or by the domestic private sector to buy foreign assets. So that means that in an environment in which foreign investors want to dump a Mexican or Brazilian commercial paper or sovereign paper, the state and several corporations have the assets to buy back their debt if they want so they're not as unhedged as they were before, and their leverage is not as high. Obviously, there will be a lot of volatility in local markets, but we don't think that this volatility will translate into bankruptcies in the financial sector or in the corporate sector that would have a systemic implication. We will see problems. I mean, there's always things that our surveillance misses, and those <laughs> where are the problems, uh, we end up having problems. But overall, uh, our surveillance points that there is a, a huge chunk of the financial sector and the corporate sector that it's relatively healthy. And on, on, on the second point, I think it will be imply a, a huge effort by governments to try to maintain the, the, the gains that have been done in, in social indicators, especially in these uh, segments of the population that move from poverty to, let's say, lower middle class, but are extremely vulnerable at the levels that we see them today. Um, because, I mean, at the end of the day, the adjustment, let's say the macroeconomic adjustment will imply that governments will have less resources. Uh, real wages 
will have to adjust or will not be able to grow at the same pace that they were growing. Third, availability of credit will be curtailed by some of these segments of the population. So it will imply a significant, a very important political challenge to move from growing at 4% to, to growing at 25 for Latin mm -hmm. America uh, as a whole. Uh, and, and it would be naive to say that we can escape this without important social pressures. We have lived through a period in which <coughs> uh, income growth and wealth creation has been very helpful to smooth the political process. And, and obviously, technically, you can devise a lot of mechanisms to maintain an important part of these gains. Because you also see, and, and, and we highlight in the report, I mean, the increase in government expenditures in the region has been very large. For me, it is, I mean, when you look at a household, when you look at a firm, when you look at a country, if you have increased your expenditures year after year in a very important amount, by definition, there, will, there exist important sources of savings maintaining the quality of the services that you're providing. Because a lot of problems have been solved just by putting more resources into them without putting the focus that we should put on efficiency. But that's something that is hard for governments to, to deliver. And I think if uh, governments will need to focus significantly in, in the governance of public expenditures and significantly monitoring, measuring, and improving the delivery of public services. And that will take time. You cannot change the way governments work. So, so, so I think it will, it will be a challenge. Uh, some governments are reacting. I mean, I, I mentioned the case of Chile. Even though Chile is the country in Latin America with the highest PISA scores, it still scores in the lowest 20% uh, of the sample. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Chile is saying, well, we have to do this. And we have to do that in a fiscally responsible way. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that will be the generalized response. Uh, but as we know from the past, hard to think that the whole sample of countries and all the governments will be able to maneuver through the political pressures that we'll be facing in the short term uh, to take the decisions that are good for the long term. I mean, in that respect, it's very commendable that the Chilean government is looking at a slowdown of their economy, and they're launching this huge uh, process mm -hmm. because they know it's good for the next 10 years, not for the next 18 months. Uh, I think we have uh, time for one more question, and I guess we have three more questions. Um, what I'm going to do is this. I'm just going to have you ask the questions, and you're going to decide if you can answer them because we have, to, um, we have to close out. But there was one of the questions was a tweeted question, and then I'm going to get to the rest. Begin. Right. One of our Twitter followers, Orange Hilius, asks, haven't structural economic problems existed in Brazil for a long time? Why are they impacting growth now in particular? OK, that's one. Let's keep on going with the questions. Gustavo? <clears throat> Alejandro, Gustavo Navat, uh, senior um, advisor here at CSIS. You mentioned uh, Argentina. The Supreme Court decision is fairly fresh, but it was one of a few anticipated outcomes. I um, was wondering if you could, if you're in a position to speak about that, um, we're all aware of the difficult relationship between Argentina and the IMF for several years. Is there any concern that Argentina will default? And then, and if so, what effect might that have on other countries in the region, particularly the Caribbean, that feel that they are overly uh, extended when it comes to external debt? Uh, Eric Langer, uh, Georgetown University. It, it's very interesting the way you divide up the country's uh, closed economies and more open economies, but I think there's another way to think about that, and that is those economies are most exposed to commodities and those that are not. Uh, and in addition to that, the smaller ones, which probably can't do very much about it, and then the larger ones, where, which actually have a domestic economy large enough to, if you will, pirouette uh, towards more infrastructure growth and things like that. And if you perhaps can see a different kind of division within Latin America between the small, very exposed economies and those that are exposed but have the ability uh, to change uh, towards uh, more internal economic growth rather than being so dependent upon commodities growth. And the last question up here, gentlemen. 
Yes, hi, Adrian Gillum from the American Chemical Society. Uh, recently, President Nieto uh, recently pledged more GDP funding towards science, technology, research and development, and uh, certain sectors of the economy that deal with developing smart capital. Uh, I was wondering if you could probably uh, project or comment on whether you see other Latin American countries taking similar steps to deter what could be seen as a brain drain trend, uh, young Latin Americans leaving their uh, home or their respective countries for better opportunities in the United States or elsewhere. Thanks. Just one more. <laughs> one more. Uh, thank you. Uh, sure. Miriam Kornblit from the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, one question. Do you see opportunities in this new cycle? Just, and the other question is, uh, what about Venezuela? Venezuela's influence in the region uh, going through this economic crisis, what kind of impact will it have, especially in Central America, Caribbean? Thank you. Okay, so there's, there, there are many questions, so um, many good questions. I wish we could answer them all. Well, I think a few of them are answered in the report. I mean, I would turn to, or draw your attention to the box 2.2 on Argentina and Venezuela's impact on the region. So just as a shortcut. <laughs> okay, I mean, I mean, on Venezuela, maybe uh, as uh, it has been said, the impact goes through a lot through the oil sales and financial support that Venezuela is giving to a lot of uh, countries in Central America and, and, and the Caribbean. That's an important uh, fragility uh, uh, for, uh, for these countries. In terms of uh, why are we bringing up structural issues in Brazil now when they have been there for a long time? Yeah, I think uh, we definitely concur with that view. Brazil had a very, a very good, let's say, five years, five to seven years associated with important reforms, stabilization, financial deepening, mm -hmm. The, the impressive development of their oil industry and the impressive development of their agricultural sector in relation to the commodity shock. But that kind of step effect is over mm -hmm. and now they're back to facing with their structural problems. So uh, they did things very well. They had a, an, an important positive shock from the outside. That is done mm -hmm. and now it's back to, to the reality of working on fundamentals and structural issues. I mean, I, I mean, at this stage, we are studying the, the, the situation in Argentina, trying to understand uh, and waiting to see how they will react and how uh, the investor community will react before we actually structure an, 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 an opinion. I think the, the, the issue between small and, and large uh, commodity exporting economies, it's an important one. I mean, I think larger economies with a larger financial sector, et cetera, have more levers to, to, uh, to generate growth from their domestic economy. I think now the problem is some of those economies in Latin America didn't use the good times to save and to deleverage as much mm -hmm. as you needed to be able in this period to relever and, and use the, this space. So you, you're coming to this point in the cycle after a period of significant uh, uh, windfall of income, but also increasing leverage. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a trend break in Latin America that it's interesting. Uh, when you look at uh, the current account balance, for a short brief period of history in Latin America from 2003 to 2008, Latin America exhibited a current account surplus. So these countries were saving part of the windfall. After 2008, we went back to deficit, even though commodity prices went back up. So that's a little bit the, the, the problem to, to think that even large economies can actually forcefully implement some counter-cyclical <laughs> policies uh, uh, to face this, uh, this new environment. Yeah, I mean, just a last comment um, on the question around sort of pivoting the, into new markets. And Barbara mm -hmm. talked a little bit, mentioned services earlier and relates to the question about sort of migration. I don't know the number specifically on youth migration from Latin America, but roughly rough, about a third of international migrants globally are youth, so I would expect the trends from Latin America to be the same. But I think it's exciting to think about you know, what 
services, higher value added agriculture, tourism, hospitality, huge opportunity um, to engage in that space. But really what it comes down to is what are, again, are, is the, will the labor force needs be and how you get there? And it's, you know, the, it's foundational investments in, again, primary, secondary education, science, technology, math. Um, but again, where can you engage the private sector to really understand what are the skills going to be needed and how can those partnerships happen to make sure that people are ready? There's some interesting things happening in different sectors um, with different corporate leaders um, to really understand what the needs and the opportunities are and make sure that the labor force is going to be ready, willing, and able. Willing, also a key piece of that in terms of expectations management on all sides. Um, something we can talk about perhaps. Yeah, and just really quickly, I think the question on R&D investment is really is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Latin America is one of the regions with the lowest number of patent filings and with the lowest investment in research and development. Um, and there are studies that show that boosting that gets good gains. And so if you look at sectors that have done well, even in countries that may not have grown as much, those tend to be successful. So a number of countries have put more resources into investing in research and development science and technology, Costa Rica and Panama are two that come to mind. Um, and so I think that you know, this is a, a laudable effort by President Peña Nieto and hopefully others will follow suit. Although of course it's much more difficult as the degrees of freedom for policymakers are, are um, narrowing. But it's difficult. It's a, it's a time to make hard choices, winnow out those policies that will yield gains for, for the most and greater growth gains um, and, and less policies that won't. Great. So with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Nicole, and Barbara, Alejandro. You've been great. This is, uh, I think this has been a very comprehensive panel, which I think when you talk with economic, well, about economic issues and finance, it can get a little dry. So I think it was important to sort of give things context. These figures are great in, the, uh, in, in your publication, The Regional Economic Outlook for the Western Hemisphere. We really appreciate that you came, that the IMF was willing to work with us on this issue. We hope we can continue doing those things. I want to thank all of you for coming and for the folks that watched. So thank you very much. Thanks.